Okay, I think we'll get started. I know people are getting settled still. Um, welcome to the South Orange Library Special Conversations Program. So great to see so many people out. Um, I'm Laura Sims, and I'm thrilled to have Nancy Solomon with us tonight. Um, Nancy, as you may know, is senior reporter with WNYC and the founding managing editor of New Jersey Public Radio. She started to work in radio at KLCC in Eugene, Oregon in 1995 and then moved um, to New Jersey in 2001. Quite a, quite a change, I imagine. Yes. We got a discount on the moving van because nobody moves east. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's been covering our lovely state ever since. She's produced more than 100 stories for NPR and was a 2008-2009 Spencer Fellow in Education Reporting at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. During that year, Solomon produced Mind the Gap, Why Good Schools Are Failing Black Students, for which she won a Peabody Award. Long before becoming a journalist, about Columbia High School. About Columbia High School. Ooh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Long before becoming a journalist, Solomon was the first woman ever hired to work on the county road crew in Portland, Oregon, and I want to hear more about that. <laughs> I should do a podcast. I really should. Really should. Um, so tonight we'll be discussing the N her N WNYC podcast, Dead End, about a double murder and New Jersey politics. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Solomon. So, Nancy, I know we're going to talk about the podcast, and I thought maybe you could introduce it a little, and then we have you have some clips to play. Sure, right? sure. Um, well, maybe I don't want to shame anyone because, of course, you don't need to have listened to the podcast. But I'm curious how many of you have. Okay. So we're talking to an audience that knows. Um, so um, maybe I, I didn't see, is, the, is there anyone here who doesn't know what the podcast is about that I should explain it quickly? Okay, fine. <laughs> Wait, was there a hand that went up? Yes? A few no. people, yeah. Okay, so it's a true crime story about a murder of a very prominent uh, couple. Uh, a man who was uh, worked for several governors and was a sort of leading moderate Republican back in the day. Um, and they were murdered in their bedroom in the middle of the night. Um, and what the podcast does is it's sort of, that's kind of the narrative hook and the leaping off point to tell a story about political corruption in New Jersey because he was connected to a very powerful political boss, George Norcross. Um, and so um, it's really also about corruption in New Jersey and the, and the way the machines work, the way George Norcross's machine works, and the way that, um, and, and about Camden, and how Camden, one of the country's poorest cities, or the people of Camden get shafted by this corruption. And it was never solved. Right? And the murder has yet to be solved. Um, while the while we were rolling out the episodes of the podcast in the in last spring, the uh, New Jersey State Attorney General announced that they were uh, opening the case. So, and the way that works is so county prosecutors pro investigate and prosecute all major crimes in the in the state, you know, that happen in their county. But the state attorney general is the supervisor of all those county prosecutors and has the right and is supposed to and meant to what's called supersede, take over the investigation of anything that they feel that the county prosecutor's office for whatever ever reason can't handle as well as maybe as they could. So for instance, a case that crosses county lines, which this one kind of did, um, and a, or a case that's just very complicated or a case that requires a lot of um, crime lab work, which the state police has the best crime lab in the state. So there are all kinds of reasons why an attorney general would want to supersede an important case. Oh, and a, a murder of a very important person. Um, so, and that was one of the big questions we wanted to solve, what, or to sort of interrogate, which is, you know, why didn't the attorney general in 2014 take over this case? So, most of you know all that, this, that's what the podcast is about. 
um, I guess what I would say, you know, what, what you don't get from listening to the podcast is that what had happened was that in, in 2019, I spent the whole year with a, a grant from ProPublica, an investigative reporting organ, nonprofit media organization. Um, I had a grant to work the whole year on um, a, what I had pitched to them to be about uh, the political machines in New Jersey and, and the party bosses. I spent the whole year on George Norcross. I never got to any of the other party bosses because uh, I couldn't hardly do everything I wanted to do about him in that year. Um, but during that year, I sort of backed into a, a story about what was going on with George Norcross in the Camden waterfront and uh, the fact that he had muscled into this land deal that a small a nonprofit redevelopment organization in Camden had made that was going to be good for them um, and forced them to turn it over. Um, and I also did a bunch of work that year on the state corporate tax break program and the way that, that George Norcross and uh, several companies allied with him or were clients of his brother uh, had taken advantage of the state corporate tax break program to the tune of $1.1 billion. So that was 2019. And, and to be honest, I was really frustrated with, my, with the work that year because it was really hard. I wanted more attention. I wanted people to pay more attention to these stories. But they're really hard stories to get people to engage with because they're about like documents and numbers and tax breaks <coughs> programs and and uh, and land deals with you know real estate and, and and characters that no one's ever heard of people you know so there was just nothing for people to really like latch on to and kind of go with me on that journey certainly some people were paying attention but it wasn't the kind of breakthrough that I wanted in terms of the public discourse um, so by the end of 2019 I had uh, this idea like well oh and in the fall of 20, well, not the, at some point in 2019 when I was doing that reporting, I s basically stumbled across the fact that the nonprofit development group in Camden that I was talking to about this, all this stuff going on on the Camden waterfront and the tax breaks and who owns that land, and I learned that, well, um, John Sheridan was the chairman of their board. I knew that he had, I knew when he was murdered in 2014 that he was the CEO of Cooper Hospital and that hospital is, the chairman of the hospital is George Norcross, so I knew there was a Norcross connection um, that was kind of a little intriguing, but I didn't really, I, I didn't understand that John Sheridan was involved in this small nonprofit as in his role as doing development work in Camden because the hospital is a major economic driver in the city. And that he had, and the guy that I'm talking on the phone with this guy who was like the president of the organization at the time, who's telling me about a huge fight that he witnessed and that he, he said, you know, that John <coughs> Sheridan had been fighting with Norcross and that he had, you know, this big, huge screaming match with him and uh, Norcross had fired him and then had come back and said, no, I'm sorry, I lost my temper, you're not fired. And he tells me this and I'm literally like, I practically am falling out of my chair. Um, and I get off the phone and I just kind of like popped up out of my desk from my desk chair and went running over to my editor. I was like, you're not going to believe this. So um, that was 2019 and so by the end of 2019 I'd hatched this idea, well, let's do a true crime serialized podcast about this and and instead of and back into the corruption story and hook listeners with a murder story see if we could you know of course it'd be nice if we can solve it but even if we can't solve it there could be a good payoff for the listener by the end if we can kind of you know bring all this other stuff to light so you, you, were, you were the first person, at least publicly, to make the connection between the Sheridan's murder and Norcross and, and that bigger story. There is not a political reporter in the state who was not aware, and yeah. uh, most reporters were, were aware of Sheridan's connection to George Norcross in the sense that he was the CEO of the hospital, and the right. hospital is like the center of the Norcross empire in Camden. 
Um, so everyone was aware of that. And intriguingly, I mean, we don't even get into it in the mm -hmm. podcast, but so sh the Sheridans were killed in late September 2014. In June of 2014, uh, Norcross was engaged in a huge battle over ownership of the Philadelphia Inquirer. He had bought the Inquirer with a business partner, a guy named um, Lou Katz, uh, who was like a billboard advertising magnate in South Jersey and Philly. And they had had an immediate falling out over the ownership of the paper and basically had gone to court and there had been an auction and Norcross had lost to him. And then like three days after he loses the auction and loses control, was going to lose control of the Inquirer to this guy, Lou Katz, Lou Katz's small airplane crashes on a Boston, you know, Logan Airport runway. Wow. So it, and that turned out, I mean, I've, I've got it on good authority from someone who investigated that case that it was uh, pilot error. Um, but seven people died, and so th so reporters were like super suspicious of these two killings that were related right. to Norcross, uh, but um, they couldn't. But no, you know, they, you you need proof of these things. You can't just right. go off saying them. Well, look, here I am going off. And saying them. <laughs> <laughs> How is it in the back? Can you hear okay? Okay. Does the mic help? Can't hear the mic. No, okay. Mic's not on. Yeah. 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 It doesn't seem like it made a difference. It's a great problem. <laughs> well, if you don't, yeah. Yeah. It's there's, it's turn it there's no on off button on it. Well, there's no on off. Okay. Oh, no. no. Uh, anyway, I think you can project. Yeah. Um, so, would now be a good time to play the clips? Or? Um, sure. So, um, I, one of the things I wanted to talk about. You know, because I get, you know, you've all heard the podcast and I'll answer any questions you have, but sort of my idea about these sorts of things is to kind of pull back the curtain and show you a little bit about the decisions we make, how we make them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, what, what, people lo I, what people love about podcasts, I think, in my humble opinion, and what those of us who make, audio, you know, our audio journalists and most of us, you know, many of us, started in radio and public radio and have migrated to podcasts is because because of the longer form you can do so much you know the difference between uh, an eight-part series with half-hour episodes and a four-minute piece mm -hmm. on the air uh, that's huge Almost, right yeah. so um, and I think those of us who produce radio love to be able to tell those stories and, and get into all the details. Um, and I think that's why they've become so popular uh, as a form, you know, a, med a medium that people really like. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe now would be a good time to give a shout out to Scott Gurian in the front row. Wait, <laughs> raise your hand. Uh, a radio producer. He and I have worked together for many years. And, Podcast Far From Home is, uh, he basically decided, I love traveling, I, I want to make a podcast about traveling, right? My close. <laughs> stories from yeah. far flung places, my adventures around the world, yeah. Yes. Like they Mongolia, really, and they are. Turkmenistan, and places most people never go to, Chernobyl, yeah. 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 It truly is far flung. <laughs> um, so, anyway, thanks for coming, Scott. So, so the tape I brought. Here is an example of something you can do in a podcast that you cannot do on the radio. And it's why, you know, I think what we're seeing is a very different form, a, a different kind of storytelling, because that ability to, the room to breathe and to let a conversation uh, really kind of take place almost in real time. Uh, you know, is a different. It's a different way to engage in the story, and it, it's. Um, and you know, so anyway, that's that's what I wanted to. Okay. And I did. I give you two, a short and a long version. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, first, play the short. Oh, short. Okay. And this this is what I would have to do to this no, piece wait. of tape. Sorry. And uh, neither does Bob. This is what I would have to do to this tape, if I were producing it for air. Right. I don't believe it. And uh, neither does Bob, or our friends. Any. Anybody I know does not believe that that happened. And I, I think it's a false accusation and that this family has to suffer like this. That would be for the radio. This is for the podcast. 
To start, I needed to know more about the Sheridans, so I drove down to the Jersey Shore to meet Joyce's best friend, Chris Stevens. She was waiting outside for me, standing on the corner so I wouldn't miss her street. Inside, she'd laid out pastries and coffee. It's water and Thank all you. that, and then uh, I got you some. Uh, That's very sweet. It's, it's good. For, we moved down in 2016. It's just the two of us and our new dog, Angus. It was a handful. Uh, but The last time Chris saw Joyce was only a day and a half before she died. She would call and she'd say, uh, Chris, call me. Let's go to lunch. They had lunch at the Tiger's Tail, a pub about five minutes from their homes. And um, just had a, a nice, usual lunch with Joyce. Laughed. That was fun. I, I always look forward to going to see her. I didn't ever want to, you know, to have to cancel on something because I enjoyed her so much. She was like a sister. You know, I, I have two sisters. Well, she was another sister. Chris was a social worker, Joyce a public school teacher, and both husbands were lawyers who were involved in government. Both couples had four kids about the same age. The two families lived in the suburbs not far from Princeton, Joyce in Skillman and Chris just down the road in Belmede. I really appreciated her humor. Um, she was a very independent, but such a good friend. She would knit me um, scarves and, and hats, and I couldn't do anything with my fingers. I'm a mess. So she um, sort of took care of me in that way. Joyce was also tough. She always got the troublesome kids, you know, they always put them in her class because she was so good and could handle anybody, and she didn't take any guff. Chris was just back from church on that Sunday morning when her husband came in to tell her the Sheridans had died. She was stunned. And then the detectives decided it was a murder-suicide. I, I don't feel comfortable talking about this because I don't believe it. And uh, neither does Bob. And we neither do any of our kids or our friends. Any, anybody I know does not believe that that happened. What about it makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't need to say, but... Because um, I don't believe it. And I, I think it's a false accusation and that this family has to suffer like this. And then to bring it back up again. Why'd you bring it back up again? Because something came up and you have to investigate it. And I understand that. But I don't have anything else to say except that I miss her and I miss John. And uh, you mentioned that you talked about kids and grandkids. Was there anything on her mind that was bothering her? I know where you're going, but no. I, I'm definitely not. I know you have to ask the question, but no. She, uh, I think she would have said to me. Detectives think John Sheridan murdered his wife and set their bedroom on fire before taking his own life, apparently to cover up what he had done. But Chris and Joyce were close and Joyce never mentioned a single problem about her marriage to Chris. I heard this a lot from neighbors, friends, colleagues, family members. I couldn't find a single person who could tell me about a problem in their marriage. <laughs> the whole time I was like, oh, this is way too long. Um, I, you know, I wanted to play that because and there's just so many things to talk about with that clip, with that whole segment. Um, you know, obviously, if you heard that little bit in the what I pulled, like I, I went back to it in preparation of this, and I thought, okay, if I were going to pull this for a story, a, a story for air, what would I take, mm -hmm. and wh how would I cut it? And that's how I would cut it. You, if you paid attention, you'd hear there was a long edit in the middle um, that I cut out of that one part. Um, so, you know, and we do that every day. We edit people down, really, you have to be for the radio. We don't have that much time, and we, we have to be kind of ruthless. But, so, but it's also instructive because 
that interview, I mean, I love Chris Stevens so much. I love her, I love her voice, I love the way she talks because she talks like a real person. And so many times as a reporter when you're interviewing people, um, you get this sort of sound bitey kind of way that people talk to you. Um, or, you know, rehearsed sort of a story that they've told them, you know, or lines that they've said a million times. Um, and unfortunately, our governor is probably the worst example of that. Um, so, nice guy, but I wish he would talk like a normal person. Um, but Chris was just such a, like, unvarnished, unpracticed, uh, real person. And everything about that, I mean, I spent more than an hour with her, and then I spent another hour there with her husband, who also was <coughs> the gold mine for me, because he turned out, I didn't even know till I got there that he had been, he had worked in the Attorney General's office, but, um, so, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, but it was, there was just so much, so much, like, wonderful, there were so many wonderful things that she said, but then there were just these amazing details, like, um, you know, I arrive, it's cold out, it's winter at the shore, and she's standing out on her street corner because she was worried that I would miss, I wouldn't find her house, which is like, you know, it's kind of cute now with GPS, like, <laughs> no, I'm not going to have trouble finding your house, and I just thought, like, I just loved that. And then, I mean, you, you know, she had the pastries set out for me. She had like a whole tray of pastries and a pot of coffee that she had made. Um, so she was just like a delight. And it was, so, you know, just the, the ability to kind of dwell a little bit on those, um, those details is, I think, the hallmark of this longer format. Um, and, um, uh, oh, and there was one other thing that it's also instructive of. So, we really struggled in when we were writing the episodes on about the decision about whether to start with the the crime, which is essentially a, now episode two. You know, and you hear, I mean, it's I, it's a little cliched, I'll admit. You know, starting with the nine one one tape, and you hear the bah, 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 the phone and the and you know the police and them coming and um, so, but. My instinct was to start there. Like I, I kind of like chronological stories. Start at the beginning and tell the story. Um, but we had Chris Stevens, and my executive producer loved that tape. I loved that tape. Um, and then we, we so we thought, well, can we start with her? And then we started to struggle with, like, okay, do you care? More? Do you hook people narratively? Do you hook them on the story by starting with the kind of the most sort of racy, exciting parts, the murder and the 911 tapes and that morning and the scene? Or but or does that stuff land better and stronger if you start by telling who the Sheridans are? So these are just some of the decisions like I mean, we spent a lot of time back and forth between that. I, I, I mean, each episode I must have written and rewritten a god-awful number of times. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, 15, 20 times each episode. I wrote, got edited, rewrote, rewrote, rewrote. I mean, it was a fantastic team, uh, and it was like an incredible, amazing thing to be, to have so much time at work that I was given to do this. Uh, but. You know, so that's a little bit of what the decisions <coughs> and what it takes. And you did start with the 911 call ultimately? Uh, no, ultimately we started with the, we start with the memorial. Mm -hmm. okay, First we put in a little thing about the sh a different case at the top because we felt like everybody was kind of paying attention to that again. I mean, right. people were talking about the Sheridans for the first time in years yeah. because of this other case that had happened right while we were writing and finishing up. Yeah. Um, and. Um, so we tacked that on the beginning and then, but the, the real beginning is the memorial service and the idea is like nobody, I mean, John Sheridan was a very important person, a very prominent person, uh, but he wasn't anyone anyone had ever heard of, mm -hmm. except for like people involved in politics. Mm -hmm. So we felt like we needed to introduce people to like him and his importance and who he was. Mm -hmm. and. So starting with the fact that 1,800 people attended the memorial, and then you hear former Governor Christy Todd Whitman talking about him, it kind of like gives you like a, 
oh, this guy, he was somebody, you know, right. or that right. was the hope. And then your interview with Chris is so gripping because it really makes them, really brings them to life, the couple to life as people and like great people, you know. Yeah. Very that was human. The idea. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And did you want me to play the oh, next one? Oh, sure, let's clip? play the next okay. one. So this one I put in because one of the other challenges, you know, I had trouble in 2019, I talked about how frustrated I was with those stories that didn't quite land as strongly as I wanted them to. And one of the other issues I had with that reporting was is that they're just like death to radio kind of stories. <laughs> they're, they're heavy, heavy, like document-driven. Um, they... You know, meaning that you get your information by these, the, by the do open public record requests that you've gotten from government documents, and they're full of numbers and you know tax breaks, and it was, it was really hard to make radio out of it, um, and so I still had that challenge with the podcast. I had to come up with a way, and so. John Sheridan's son, Mark Sheridan, is, as you all know, like a really central character mm -hmm. uh, in the podcast. And he had provided my, in, my, in 2019, my co-reporter, Jeff Pillitz, and I were able to get a lot of the, doc, the documents that were left on the dining room table um, that detailed the whole fight that he was having with George Norcross. So he provided us with those documents in 2019 but it wasn't until 21, yeah, the summer of 21, that he agreed finally to be interviewed. And, and believe me, I worked on him for a long time. And I, you know, just called, I met with him, I talked to him uh, so many times. And, um, and so we, we're here, we're like working on this podcast, and we don't know whether we're going to have him on tape. And we don't know whether, and we need somebody because these damn documents are so important. But they don't, they, it, it's hard to make documents come alive for, for audio, for radio. So, you know, he finally agreed. And, um, and so this is kind of how we used Mark Sheridan as a character, just to speak about sort of narrative, how we used him as a character to try to make these documents come to life. About two months after his parents were killed, Mark Sheridan needed to file their taxes. They asked uh, the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office for all of the materials that they had taken from the house, copies of whatever they had. And what they gave Mark surprised him. It was enough to fill a banker's box. When I got back the files from the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office, all of the L3 documents were there. L3. It's an office complex on the Campton waterfront. The documents were all about the sale of those buildings. And I'm trying to get my arms around it, and I start to see from those emails that there was a fight over this issue, over this property. Mark knew about this because his father had asked him for legal advice about it five months before his death. His dad was upset about the issue back then, but the banker's box had more documents and details that Mark hadn't seen. They'd taken everything on the dining room table, essentially, and so when I started looking through all of that, I was stunned to see those documents out and about in September of 2014. But there the documents were, on the dining room table, the night his parents were killed. Mark had discussed this real estate deal with his father. He knew how stressed he'd been about it months before. And I know that this is what my father was upset about. There were handwritten notes about phone calls and meetings, email exchanges that were printed out, and everything was dated. I called Mark recently because I wanted to know if this was typical for his father. He was always had a notepad in his hand when he was on the phone. Uh, the full recitations of phone conversations and follow-ups uh, is something I've never seen from him before, though. 
Do you think it's fair to characterize it as a paper trail? It definitely looks like a paper trail, absolutely. <laughs> Again, that that clip is just so illustrative of so many things. For, for one thing, that's episode six, and my editor and executive producer pretty nearly tortured me over that episode. It was so hard. Like, we just, I, I kept rewriting it, and they kept saying no, and I kept rewriting it, and they kept saying no, we're not there yet. Um, and so it just is funny to listen to now. Um, but also then I was sort of squeezed between my editor and executive producer on the one side and then our lawyers on the other because why I had to call Mark Sheridan and ask him if this looked like a paper trail is because the lawyer was like, no, you can't say that's a paper trail. <laughs> and I was, you know, so it, it's, you know, there was a lot of concern that we were going to be sued by Norcross and uh, like a lot of concern and we went through many meetings um, so this is sort of it's, it's interesting it tells a lot of stories that little clip so there's the sort of the narrative power of having Mark tell this in the you know tell it as it really unfolds that he finds these documents because they were on the dining room table etc um, and then also I just I love the music so much um, Jared Paul our mix engineer and sound designer composed all the music in the entire podcast and um, it's just like it I the difference between being able to you know now you know the way music sets a mood is just I never really I mean I understood it I understood that but I never really thought about it much because I was a news reporter on the radio like we're not allowed to use music unless it's organic to the story because you're you know it's a story about a music show or it's something that where music is involved um, and otherwise we're not allowed and so to be able to move into this other <coughs> new territory and be able to use it um, you know and really Jared was the genius behind I mean you know I went through the script and kind of highlighted places and had like a code for him like we want to build tension here, but really it was him. Um, but the, you know, so the ability to really affect how you hear it and the mood with the music is also just really um, another thing that for now sets podcasts apart since, I mean, it's true that you hear it on This American Life and Radio Lab, and I don't think Radio Lab, but I mean, This American Life and some other radio shows, but it's really now a feature of all podcasts. And you hear this the music and you identify it with that show like it's so specific to the yeah. show yeah, yeah. And so and then we had different themes you know like that recur throughout the podcast where you know different kinds of moods or different characters or then the theme music and um, you know and I love the theme music so much I was always like come on put in more put in more and he's like no too much you know so Jared's uh, he's brilliant yeah. Why was that episode, episode six, why did it require so much revision? Because it was the most dense part of the whole story. Like, it was the, the story of how um, it was a land deal on the Camden waterfront that was being fueled by tax breaks and the connection and the, you know, and Norcross and you know his connection to it um, and then and Sheridan's connection to it like that was just really um, I, I remember rewriting the one like two sentences about how the fact that because he was like why was he on this board what was this organization like all the different relationships it was just really hard to, I mean the first time I wrote it I was like oh yeah blah 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 <laughs> you know but it was hard to get it right it was hard mm -hmm. to get it to a point where someone who's, you know, washing the dishes and listening to the podcast would that it would pierce through and stay there, yeah. and you know that's like, I mean, it's the power of narrative, but it's also like the challenge of it is, um, you know, these stories are for the ear, and you can't. It's not like you know when you're reading the newspaper and you can back up and like, what? What did that mean? I got to read that sentence again, or I got to read that last paragraph. 
you know, you we, we lose the, you yeah. can go back. I do, nowadays I do with digital, yeah. I, I do like go back yeah. and I love that. Um, and like on Netflix, just like go back 15 <laughs> seconds, I gotta see that again. Um, but generally that's how we're trained as, as, you know, audio journalists is that you write for the ear and you're not, people can't back up and you have to break it down and, and make it land. You dig up a lot of dirt through this whole through the whole podcast, and as I was listening to it, I was wondering: just were you ever afraid for your safety? Are you still afraid for your safety? Are you threatened? Yeah. Um, I was a little nervous. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and the station was nervous, and um, they installed the security system in our house, mm -hmm. oh. um, and they did one of those. Um, you know, wiping my personal information from the internet, which isn't 100%, but I guess it slows people down a little bit. Um, my wife was very nervous. Um, you know, it hasn't, so far, it hasn't been the MO of any of the people involved to uh, attack journalists. So, I didn't um, I, you know, that happens in other places in the world a lot, but it doesn't, hasn't happened in New Jersey, so I guess I felt like n no one's going to go that far. Right. And did Norcross or his people respond in any way to your, to the podcast or? Yeah. Mm, not afterwards. Um, there was, you know, you hear a little bit of the meeting. The Zoom meeting in episode four, right, right. Um, when um, I think it's fair to say they tried to bully me. Um, but so the way most I actually learned this from ProPublica because I never until I did the project with them. I mean, I had done some investigative journalism, but not that much really. Um, and they're like, that's their thing. Um, and so I learned from ProPublica that when you're doing a story, uh, an investigative story, you send what people call, what journalists call a no surprises letter. And you want to wait till you're, like, you have pretty much your whole story together because you don't want the subject of your investigation either hiding things or shredding things or getting in the way. So you wait until you've done most of your work and then the last step is sending the no surprises letter. So, um, and I had done that in 2019 with both George and Phil Norcross, his lawyer, lobbyist brother. Um, <laughs> who's the brains, by the way, behind the whole operation. Um, and um, so, I had, and so we did that again. So I sent a no surprises letter um, and I said, we're producing a podcast, and in the podcast, we're going to say this, 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 and this. Um, and But I still have questions, and I would very much like to hear from you. And I had like two pages of questions. Um, and so that elicited a pretty swift and angry response uh, that was uh, first in writing and threatening a lawsuit and kind of... Um, Attacking me, like, uh, basically, because uh, it went to, like, the CEO of, w of New York Public Radio and every editor that they had a name for um, and an email address for. So, you know, the, and in the letter, they basically make the argument that I am uh, biased and, and sloppy and wrong. Um, and they included, you know, anything that had, there were like a few things public that were, had been criticized and they included all those links. Um, the, a website that I will not name because I don't want to give it any more clicks than it's going to get. Uh, it makes a regular habit of attacking me and so um, they had all of those. Um, you know, so that then meant meetings with them and, um, and, in, and we only agreed to meet with them if, we could if it would be on the record and we could record it, which was fantastic. Um, they agreed to it, it was on Zoom, and, um, and I couldn't get them 
to really answer any questions. It was just, you have to say that George Norcross had nothing to do with this murder, whatever the line was. And I wouldn't say it. I said, I'll think about, you know, yes, it's a, you make a good point. Let, us, <laughs> let me talk to my editors and we'll work it out. I'm not going to promise the language, right? I mean, it's so, uh, but that wasn't good enough. So then we had them hanging up on us. It made for great radio. <laughs> um, it was a little uncomfortable at the moment, but I was pretty happy to have that tape. It's worth it. Um, yeah. And my executive producer, my editor, and two lawyers from WNYC were on that call and never said a word, mind you. Um, but they had warned me that I was going to have to do all the talking, so it was, it was a little rough. <laughs> Wow. And you mentioned that um, they've reopened the case, so will there be future episodes of Dead End? I had hoped that we would um, do at least one bonus episode this past fall. Um, I, I got a ton of, when the podcast came out, I just got a ton of like ideas and tips. Is that my phone? No. Um, <laughs> and... Um, you know, like over the transom, anonymous letters. Um, my favorite was a, a birthday card that was a Monopoly theme, and it had the like get out of jail free guy on the on the card, and then um, inside was a like two page single space typed letter and a thumb drive. That was pretty exciting. And the get out of jail free card was taped inside. Um, I have no idea who sent this. Um, but, and it had a lot of stuff about um, county prosecutors and how bad they are across the state. And um, so I'd hoped wow. to do something on that. Yeah. Um, I just haven't been able to pull it off. Um, and so now we're talking about a season two that would be something completely different. Uh, but it would involve murder in New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> Our brand. Yeah. Uh, well, murder New Jersey and, and some major Politics. issue of, of uh, an issue, a public okay. uh, interest issue. Well, I'm pretty sure there are questions <laughs> out there. So, yes. Is there a connection ended with the North Cross? North Cross. Or if you... Uh, notice any connection with uh, other people, politicians, uh, business people that you haven't pursued? Yeah. It related to the Sher Sheridan murder? Yes. Yeah. No, not specifically, no. I mean, I think, I, you know, that is what Mark Sheridan believes. Like, I, you know, I think he... He personally believes that there were so many people who stood to gain from what was going on in the Camden waterfront, um, particularly, you know, or specifically like business people, uh, but some political characters as well. Um, that he's, you know, that he says it's he wouldn't say it was George Norcross that that's what he believes, but that it's somebody he believes. His father's murder was related to that fight going on on the Camden waterfront. Who was the person who put out the hit? He doesn't know. I don't know. Um, but he believes really that it has to do with that deal, which, you know, I mean, people don't just get murdered in the middle of the night in their home. I mean, some do, but very, very small numbers. Um, so. And to have the to have the documents have been sitting on the dining room table, and for there to be more than a billion dollars at stake with that deal, um, you know. So, you know, George Norcross individually, I don't think anybody can say right now, but that somehow that deal was really. Uh, had to be involved in whatever motivated the murders. I think that's a pretty reasonable argument to make. You pick the. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious. Has the podcast gotten like widespread general interest, or is this story like really just of interest to people in New Jersey? Yeah. 
I'm very proud and happy to say <laughs> that um, it, in terms of audience numbers, it performed better than any other WNYC podcast release. Not a show that already had an audience on the air like Radio Lab, um, but as a one-off feed that they that we created uh, for a uh, for a, a serialized story, it performed way better than anything else we've ever put out. Um, and I think that the downloads, I should know this, but I don't, but I, I think it was, you know, somewhere close to two million. Um, and that the audience was across the whole country. It wasn't just in Jersey. In fact, I don't even, I'm not even sure New Jersey was our largest audience. I think it might have been California. Um, of course. Yes. Um, why do you think the initial group of investigators mm -hmm. decided so quickly that this must be a murder yeah. suicide? Yeah. If nothing else, the reputation of the people who were killed yeah. Yeah. would say it's highly unlikely that this could possibly yeah. be a murder suicide. Or, and even if that's what you believe, like go out and actually investigate it and try to prove that it's true. I mean, okay, so I have a lot to say about that. It's a great <laughs> question. Um, I started out with kind of the working <coughs> theory that I wanted to try to answer was that it was corruption and mm -hmm. that they were told to back off. That's what I believed. That's what the only thing that made sense to me. And it just seemed, because I, because I know how powerful George, like George Norcross was very, had a very, very close working relationship with Chris Christie. Right. Chris Christie was governor at the time. And, and, Chris, and the Sheridans were Republicans. So, and Mark Sheridan worked for Christie. Yeah. So how, how do you not like jump in and say, we're going to get to the bottom of this. It's on a, you know, no way did he kill his wife. Mm -hmm. Like it just didn't make sense. Like everything about it didn't make sense. And um, so I did, I did think it was corruption and I came to believe that it was uh, incompetence and not corruption. I, I believe that the county prosecutor was on the phone with the AG's office regularly about it. Um, and maybe that was a sort of convenient quick end and they just wanted it to go away. It's possible, but I, I can't prove that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that I, I, I definitely found evidence of the incompetence of that unit. So there's the whistleblower suit um, the guy, Jeffrey Scazafava, the detective who was their forensics uh, expert, and he's away the one week, the week that this happens and is not there for the whole processing of the crime scene, mm -hmm. and then sees all kinds of problems with the way they handled the evidence. Um, so, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, conclusive about sort of the incompetence of, the, of that detective unit. Whether there was also additional pressure, I can't say. Yes. Um, in one of your last episodes, I think it's the next to the last, you um, raised the issue of cattle or Cadell or... Sean Cattle. Sean Cattle. So at that time that you were doing it, he was just pleading guilty, I think, or just arrested. Mm -hmm. there, and you, you raise the implication this was a guy who did political hits. He's admitted to political hits. Could there be a connection? But you don't say. <laughs> and then there was an article just this last week, I think, um, in J.com. Yeah, Ted Sherman says that. that. Yeah. It's a year later. He pled guilty a year ago. But he hasn't been sentenced. And that implies that he was spilling beans on other murders and hitmen and so forth. So, do you have any? Can you elaborate a little? <laughs> what you really wanted to write but couldn't? Yeah. No yeah. Um, could you, could you repeat? Summarize the question, please. Yeah. 
I, could, I couldn't hear. I'll summarize. Oh, summarize the question. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> just, just a key point. Sean Cattle, what did you want to say but couldn't on the podcast? Hold on. Yeah. Um, not that much, really, because, um, you know, the Sean Cattle case broke, the news about it broke in, um, I think it was like the very last day of January or the fir first few days of February of of 22, and we were in, you know, massive post-production at that point, like crazily trying to get everything ready for the April release. Um, so at that point, I wasn't like doing a lot of reporting. I was, you know, trying to finish the podcast. And um, I am just as confused by that case as everybody else. I think that, I don't think that it doesn't seem likely that he is going to uncover or testify about other murders, other hitmen, other that kind of level of uh, criminal wrongdoing. I think that you know what appears to be being investigated. I mean, this is a guy who ran um, dark money political campaign fundraising operations that are that are largely legal, but, you know, the problem with knowing what's legal and what's not with those dark money groups is that you don't know, because it's shielded from the public, who's donating to them. So, you know, this is something that the Supreme Court has opened up the uh, can of worms to and is allowing. Um, and so, you know, I, I believe that his involvement in New Jersey politics is largely around those uh, campaign uh, um, spending and campaign fundraising groups, um, and I think that, I don't really know, but my, what I expect is that wh what might come out of that in terms of further indictments would be things related to, say, what we call pay to play, where you have uh, a business that makes a donation to a, uh, someone running for office, and then they get a uh, contract with, say, the city in the city where they funded the mayor's campaign or the city council campaign. Um, there are restrictions on that, and the dark money groups have, you know, because it's shielded. You don't really know who's giving to these candidates. Um, so I think I think that's the kind of thing we'll learn possibly that'll come out in terms of, sort of political corruption in New Jersey. I could be wrong, but I think it would be unusual if it's um, more murder. <laughs> so, so can I ask why did you mention him? Well, you know, it was because at the when it when it when the news broke, the connections between the Sheridan case and the. Uh, Michael Galdieri killing in Jersey City were so there was there was just connections that were seemed to be worth talking about and exploring because you had two people involved in New Jersey politics murdered they were both stabbed both of their rooms were set on fire to destroy evidence um, when. Brett Sennis, the guy who's pled guilty to being one of the two hitmen, uh, when he was arrested in Connecticut the day after the Sheridan murders in September 2014, um, he had a, a kitchen knife in the car that was taken by police. The Sheridans were killed with, by a kitchen knife, and one of the kitchen knives of the, at the Sheridan house was missing. So. It seemed like, I mean, that seemed worth talking about, but I can't, I, 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 I haven't learned any more. I, I, I have been told that um, Brett Sennis is not being investigated for the Sheridan murders, off, like, kind of off the record, nothing that I could mm -hmm. publish, but. One or two more questions, yes? Where, where is Governor Murphy on all of this? Has he been uh, supportive of the investigation or has he been trying to cool it? 
he doesn't really talk about it. Um, I don't think he's taken really a position. He's not, he, and I mean, I will give him credit. I think um, he, he chose an attorney general who um, seems to be very smart and uh, has integrity. Like, I so far have been very impressed with his attorney general. Um, and, I mean, the Attorney General opened the case, took it on. So, you know, that that's Murphy's pick. That's the guy he picked. They're supposed to now, now that Matt Platkin, the Attorney General, has been uh, nominated and confirmed by the Senate, he is now independent of the governor. Um, that hasn't always worked the way it's supposed to work in New Jersey uh, history. Um, but I don't have any reason to believe that that kind of firewall on criminal cases, they work together on administrative things. Uh, you know, the Attorney General is the head of the Department of Law and Public Safety and is, sits on the governor's cabinet. But when it comes to criminal matters and criminal investigations, um, there is meant to be a firewall and they're not supposed to talk about it, anything. And they, both of them have told me that they don't talk to each other about those things. But, you know, how do you know? Yes? Hi. <laughs> um, so I have a question about production of the whole thing. So I was wondering, like, do you, like, you're talking about the narrative. So do you kind of have an idea of the narrative and have kind of like an arc of the story? And then you're like, okay, here's what we want to explore, and I'm going to go and interview these people. Or is it the opposite? Like, do you go and interview a bunch of people and then say, okay, here's, you look at what you have, and then build kind of your narrative around that? It's both, because you have to have done enough research to know what the story is and who you would want to talk to, um, and to be able to then pitch the series and be able to say this, I mean, you know, an actual like pitch to get, you know, to get my employer, WNYC, to agree to give me the time to work on the series, I had to uh, go through a process and pitch the idea and write up a, you know, proposal that involved an outline with all the episodes and the description of each episode and who I would talk to and what we would likely find and what would we do if we didn't solve the murder. So all of that I had to propose and to be able to do that you have to know enough to be able to say what you can deliver. So it's a little bit of back and forth. Yeah. You do a little bit of work, you pitch it, you work to get it, you know, greenlit. You know, when it's a news story for air, it's a much quicker process, but you do a little bit of work, you pitch a story, you get it approved and you do the story. For a podcast, it's a much stretched out, longer process of needing to know more, putting together a very long, detailed proposal, and then going through meetings and conversations and putting together a, a tape that we call a sizzle. And, yeah. you know, this is what it might sound like. Uh, here are some of the voices. This is a character. Um, and so, you know, so it's a little bit of back and forth. So they rely on you, on the reporters, to come up with the ideas versus, like, the executive producers or whatever saying, why don't you go into the story about, or is it both? Both. Okay. It's both, yeah. Um, and then, you know, by the time you're actually writing the episodes, a lot changes and you rejigger everything. It doesn't work out exactly as you propose, right. but um, it's not that far off actually in the reality for dead end. The end product is not that far off from what I originally proposed. Have one last question. Yeah, back. Um, I also have kind of a question about production as well. I remember earlier one of the clips that uh, we listened to, the person being interviewed said that she was uncomfortable with the question. And I'd really like to know if you allowed any of the people you interviewed to have veto power over what was put in the final cut. And if so, what's, what was the extent? Did everyone hear? She wants to know if anyone that you interviewed had veto power of what was included ultimately in the podcast. Um, 
It's a good question. It's hard to answer because it's a little bit of everything. So, um, you know, one of the, particularly something where it's very sensitive and where people are reluctant to talk to me, I will often um, have off the record conversations. Uh, because if I know, you know, it, it, often what I'm doing is sort of hunting for a needle in a haystack. And if somebody can tell me, well, you're looking for this needle looks like this and it's sitting over here, then I, it's easier to find. So having, do it, as a reporter, having off the record conversations can be really helpful. Um, once somebody agrees to be interviewed on the record and I'm sitting there with my tape recorder on, um, I, I, I would, I do not give someone veto power, but if it's something sensitive and I feel like they're taking a risk by talking to me and I, and they deserve a little bit of slack, um, I'll say, you know, just let me know if there's anything, you know, if you want me to turn off the recorder or you want to talk about something first, you know, kind of the rule with journalism is, is that you can, you know, to go off the record, you both need to agree. You can't just say, this is off the record and start talking, that the reporter and the interview subject need to agree that it's off the record. But in reality, um, that can be a little squidgy, especially when you're dealing with people who are, you know, taking a risk in talking to you or uh, it's something very personal and emotional and you don't really want to you know, you want to offer them a certain amount of privacy. So it's really a little bit more of a give and take. Um, and I probably am a little bit, I err on the side of giving a little more leeway. And um, if somebody says, I really wish I hadn't said that, I, w I don't want you to use it, I'm, I'm more likely to do that. I mean, it would be different. I mean, if it's someone in, who has power, I might treat it a little differently than somebody who's like an everyday person and they didn't realize when they sat down to talk to me what that was going to mean. Um, so really like every single situation is a little bit different. All right. Thank you so much, Nancy. Enjoy the light refreshments we have over there. And uh, our next program for special conversations is February 9th. Um, Lisa Williamson Rosenberg is going to talk about black motherhood and her debut novel as part of our Black History Month celebration. So please come back. We have these every other Thursday, usually at 6 p.m. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.